elected today to have Christian Lavers, the Executive Vice President of US Club Soccer and President of the ECNL or the Elite Clubs National League to present today's topic, which is best practices in youth development in top clubs. Christian became the US Club Soccer's Executive Vice President in January 2011, where he oversees the club and player development programs, league initiatives, develops the organization's marketing and commercial strategies, and secures the strategic partnerships and sponsorships. Christian has extensive coaching experience, including the men's and women's coach at FC Milwaukee Nationals, FC Wisconsin Eclipse, and the Chicago Red Stars, to name a few. He is also a founder and owner of Libero Sports, LLC, a player representation and sports business consultancy company, a company that represents more than 50 professional soccer players. Christian has practiced as a corporate attorney specializing in corporate law, commercial transactions, and intellectual property since 2004. He is a USSF A licensed coach and an NSCAA Premier Diploma holder. He is also a publisher of numerous articles, um, legal related articles in a variety of professional publications and journals. Welcome Christian to the presentation. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, I'll start the presentation with sort of a, a qualifier and, and that there's not a lot of objectivity or statistics backing up or, or, or detailed research in a lot of the points we're making here. I would say most of the, the comments, most mm -hmm. of the thoughts that we're talking about here are based on uh, experience. They're subjective. And you know, one of the important things to recognize is that every club is different. And what works with one club may not work with another, and, and, and it may actually be completely counter to the mission statement of the club. So the starting point whenever talking about best practices and what the club wants to accomplish and how you best implement a staffing structure or implement a curriculum or how you basically organize your organization is always going to come down to what the club mission statement is. Uh, and that mission statement needs to define the goals and the desired outcomes uh, of the club. And you know you can look at different types of clubs that will have mission statements all over the gamut. Uh, at one level, you may have a recreation community-based club whose primary goal is to increase participation of the sport, uh, maybe focusing on youth levels, uh, maybe designed to make uh, participation easy and convenient within certain localities or certain communities. Uh, you may have, on the opposite end of the continuum, a club, uh, or in this, you know, in an ideal world, is, is, is really the purpose of an MLS uh, academy, which is to develop professional players or to develop players to play at the highest level of college soccer uh, and Division I soccer. Um, and then you have clubs anywhere in between, whether you want to call that mid-level select or regional focus or a national youth focus. Uh, th there's a mission statement, uh, a different type of mission statement for every type of club. And really that mission statement is going to drive a lot of the decisions uh, about the organizational structure and the way you set up your staff. Um, the size of the organization also is going to impact uh, the way that you accomplish that mission. Obviously big, bigger organizations with more resources provide some flexibility. Uh, they provide some additional options in terms of facilities, in terms of player pool, uh, in terms of staff size, that can be very, very positive. Uh, and smaller organizations uh, tend to be more flexible, uh, easier and quicker to adapt and be innovative, um, but they also present some challenges in terms of resources. So when we, when we look at club structure and staffing uh, and you look at best practices, it's important to start with what is the goal of the club, what is the mission of the club. So I've gone through and, and picked generally five different points that drive club success. Uh, this webinar is really going to be talking about the middle three. So at the beginning is player entry or player identification. And that's a combination of what, what is the recruiting plan, what is the talent identification plan, where do you get players, where do you identify players, and how do you bring them in. Uh, part of that you know, would be the size of the player pool as well in the area that you're drawing from. Um, obviously, if you don't have players to coach in the first place, then best practices doesn't really help you very much. 
Uh, the second point is player development, and that's really the quality of training and coaching and what happens on the field with the players on a daily basis. What is the daily experience of the players? Staff development is an integral part of that, um, and, and you'll hear me say it in this presentation several times, coaching is the most important resource and the most limited resource in youth soccer clubs, um, and what you do to identify, retain, and develop staff and how staff is deployed on the field is going to have the biggest impact not only on player development, but on player retention and the growth of the club moving forward. And then the third part we're really going to focus on here is club culture. And that really is what matters, uh, what is emphasized in the organization, how do people interact within the organization, what is the role and relationship between board members and coaches, between coaches in different age groups, and between players and teams at different age groups and different ability levels. <clears throat> so the first part of the presentation will just talk about structuring and developing a staff. And again, we're gonna we're gonna look at this from the perspective of a club that is designed with a mission to develop players for the highest youth levels, uh, to develop players to participate in college soccer in Division One through Division Three but really with, I guess, generically the statement of players and parents that come into this club, the mission is to maximize your potential and allow you to play at the highest possible level. Um, that starts with the job of the director of coaching. And really the director of coaching's main responsibility is to direct coaches. It's not to be the best coach within the organization. It's not to coach the most teams in the organization. The fundamental role of the director of coaching in a growing and vibrant club is to make sure that the best coaches possible are brought into the organization and that those coaches are given the resources and the, the skills and have the ability to do what they do successfully. That starts with identifying staff. It then moves into putting staff in the proper age group and level. And this is probably one of, if not the most important roles of a DOC. And that's identifying the personal characteristics uh, and the strengths and weaknesses of different coaches within your club and finding where they will fit most appropriately. So uh, but if you look at it from, a, from just some general examples, the high energy, uh, very easy going, happy uh, guy who's really good with youth kids probably is better with your U11, U12s and below than with the most uh, competitive, most intense, most driven, under 17, under 18, um, under 18 boys or girls team. Um, the guy who's really uh, good with uh, tactics and really smart at, uh, at explaining different ways of looking at the games and subtleties of, of ways to play in the games, probably not the best fit for your under 10 program. Um, putting staff at the right, the right age group and the right level uh, is, a, is an easy way to eliminate problems, and it's also an easy way to create major problems. Developing staff, and we'll touch on that basically, comes down to what do you do so that your coaches are getting better on a daily basis? What do you do to help ensure that coaches learn from each other? And what do you do to put in place both formal and informal uh, development and education processes? Uh, creating consistency across age groups. How do you really become a club? instead of just being a collection of teams that wear the same, uh, uh, same uniform. The DLC has a big impact on that in terms of establishing the style of play, the training methodology, the training rhythm. Uh, and that's also creating consistency from year to year. So that when players come into your club uh, at under 8 or under 10 or whatever age group is the entry age group, how do you make sure that there's a developmental plan and path so that those players who come in at the youngest ages know what they're going to be doing at each age group, the, the transition from one age group to the next is logical in terms of the skills uh, and tactics that were taught at one age group prepare them for success in the next age group. Staff identification, um, again, looking at it from the perspective of a club that's, that's mission and goal is to develop youth players uh, for the highest youth leagues and, and the college and beyond, is you're really looking for people that want to be professional developers of athletes and people. And the key, the key word there, I think, is professional. And that's not in the, uh, in, the, in the frame of somebody who's looking to be in the MLS or the NWSL or, or somebody thinking it in terms of a professional athlete, but somebody who wants to be a professional coach and what that means. 
uh, and that, that reflects everything from continuing education, uh, that reflects to how they conduct themselves on and off the field, that reflects in the way they continually grow and evolve as a coach. You know, and it's everything from being punctual and uh, uh, appearing fit and, and, and neat to being very, very uh, good in communication, both written and oral. Uh, but what does it really mean to be professional? Because if you want to develop players to the highest level, the coaches need to be role models and they need to hold themselves to the highest level. Um, when looking at new staff coming in, I think there's always people who are going to be uh, most responsive to the paycheck and how much money they can make, which typically is tied to how many teams they coach. And you know the, the problem becomes people who are most focused on money want to coach the most teams in order to get the biggest paycheck, which also diminishes their ability to be effective and their ability to, um, to develop players. So with young coaches, I think it's always more important to hire people who are enthusiastic, people who are excited about the club, people who are excited about the staff uh, and the organization's mission, over people that may have a little bit of a, a, a advantage from a, a basic experience or resume standpoint, because the enthusiastic person is going to work harder. They're going to throw themselves into it uh, more fully, and they're going to be a better staff and team player than somebody who's looking for the next big paycheck. Uh, obviously, we talked earlier about matching personality traits of coaches with attributes of ages. It's a big, big uh, deal as a DOC to figure out where people belong, and also to manage coaches who feel you know, that they want to coach into the older age groups or that there's nothing more common than a coach who might be very, very good with youth, at, you know, U10, U11, very, very good at teaching the basic technical stuff, who has uh, ambitions and aspirations to coaching the U16 and U17 top teams because that seems more exciting or because that's the age group that you know, they think about tactics more and that sounds more exciting. How do you manage that within a staff? Development, your fundamental role as a DOC comes down to training coaches to be better at what they do. Uh, that starts by putting them in the right spot and that continues with removing obstacles uh, from them in their development to providing them with the resources that they need, whether that's equipment, whether that's facilities, whether that's education, whether that's sometimes the support, uh, or in terms of removing obstacles, sometimes it's taking the parents' obstacles out of the way so that the coach can really focus on coaching and not have to deal with some of the political stuff off of the field. Uh, staff development is about also creating within the club a culture of continuing education, formally and informally. That includes the licensing uh, and expecting coaches to go through the licensing process. The phrase that I've uh, heard most about licensing that I think is really um, applicable is if you go to a, any type of symposium or license and you come away with one or two really good ideas or really new thoughts, that's a great license, that's a great symposium, and it's valuable. If you come away with 10 or 15 new ideas, you're probably way behind. And uh, that's sort of the expectation that your coaches should have as they grow older and develop in their career, is that you're going to go places and you're not going to come away with you know, a lot of new stuff, but you're going to come away with a new wrinkle on an old activity or a new way of talking about things or a new way of looking at things. <clears throat> You know, here I just put a quote in here from Arson uh, Arson Finger of really as a coach, if you if we're expecting our players to continually develop, if we're expecting our players to train on their own and push themselves to maximize their abilities, then we need to expect the same things from our coaches because our coaches fundamentally are role models for the players. Um, some basic internal staff development concepts. You know, requiring written training, distributing um, <coughs> written training plans. You know, some. <coughs> Sometimes that's viewed as a uh, negative, it's viewed as a really sort of a, a pain for coaches to go through, but requiring people to put out their trainings in writing, or now more and more clubs are digitizing them with different types of programs, whether it's PowerPoint or Global Coach or Soccer X or any of these types of programs, not only does it start to provide a library to teach younger coaches, but it also provides an opportunity for coaches to look through other people's sessions to find out how other people uh, train a concept. Um, and the distributing written training plans, and, and I say club-based here, and we'll talk about team-based versus club-based staff structures, but distributing written training plans is a great way as well to educate coaches in terms of the way you want trainings to flow, the activities you want to use, and the training methodologies. Um, 
requir requiring written evaluations of, of games, of functional lines within the games. How did the midfield play? How did the back four do? What, what are the strengths and weaknesses for individual players? Having coaches go through that, um, and whether, whether it's being assigning them to functional uh, roles within a game, if you have multiple staff coaches at, at one game, whether it's having specialists on your staff that focus more on teaching and training certain positions, that's another way not only providing feedback and value to the players and, and educating parents, but it's another way of helping uh, and putting coaches in a position where they have to get better. Because being able to teach something is a lot different than doing it, as we all know, but being able to write down um, a, a, a strengths and weaknesses and, and suggestions of how players or lines or teams get better in certain areas can support, force coaches into a more, um, uh, a more formal planning process and to think a little bit deeper. Sharing articles, blogs, journals, and books is another way of educating a staff. Um, sending, sending links to, to new uh, articles that come out is really, really easy, but it's a way to, to, to share ideas, a way to get people thinking differently, to start a dialogue about different topics. Um, that's also some, some clubs have coaches meetings where staff are assigned to present on different topics, uh, whether it's a, a new methodology of training or whether it's just a different type of activity or new activities and ways of training a new concept. Having that kind of informal discussion within a staff uh, has, goes a long way to giving people new ideas and just generating discussion that may create some new ideas. Uh, other ways of internal staff development uh, are, are mentoring and assigning coaches. To, to work with each other, young coaches, to shadow older coaches on a periodic basis, to attend training and watch. And sometimes even having your older, more experienced coaches just go and watch other coaches train to see how they deal with things, to see how they run their environment. Because again, you can pick up good and bad uh, pointers from watching other coaches. Uh, and, and that type of integration as well tends to foster dialogue. And anytime you have coaches talking about uh, teaching methodologies and talking about how they do things and why they do things, you're, you're creating the opportunity for new ideas to, to arise and for people's horizons to broaden a little bit. <clears throat> Looking at, at the way clubs uh, are staffed, there's two basic uh, staffing models as I look at clubs, and one is a team-based uh, model and one is a club-based model. And in a team-based model, and I, I would say this is probably more of the, the traditional club, is one coach per team, where that coach is, is really the, the sole focal point of those players and parents. And that coach is the primary contact. That coach is responsible for just about every aspect of the technical development of the team. Uh, and in a lot of ways, probably oversees and manages some of the administration and operations of that team. Um, I think more and more clubs at the highest levels are moving towards a club-based model now, which is multiple coaches per team overseeing uh, by a director that helps to coordinate across uh, age groups and across teams within an age group. And there's a lot of very positive uh, impacts of structuring your staff in a club-based model. If you look at a team-based model, you have decentralized control. And really, that, that's reflected by the, that the coach of each team really is running that team um, somewhat independently um, because they, they are not uh, talking formally across age groups or with other teams, and, and they are the primary coach uh, and don't have a lot of consistent support from other coaches. There's not a lot of uh, cooperation and communication required in this, so it's a definitely a less uh, demanding structure uh, and easier to implement. Um, and it's team-based training in the sense that teams tend to train by themselves, and maybe there's an occasional time where teams come together and train or scrimmage each other in a training game, but really it's 18 players, one coach, half of a field, or whatever the facilities allow, and everybody's operating sort of independently. In contrast, the club-based model has centralized control that goes through either the director of coaching or a technical director of certain age groups or of certain programs or whatever the title may be, but there's one person who's connecting the training methodology, connecting the teams in terms of what they're focusing on and how they're being coached. There's high levels of cooperation and communication required between the staff at multiple age groups and at multiple teams and between the staff and the coach. And it's more of a pool-based training concept, which is 
players from multiple teams coming together on a regular basis, uh, breaking up into functional groups on a regular basis, and there's a lot more of a uh, variety in terms of the training pool, which obviously has some positive impacts on the development and uh, on the, uh, the challenges that the players have faced. So th this slide shows sort of just a graphic example of a team-based versus a club-based model. Uh, you can see in the club-based model, you really generally have the same staff working across multiple teams. So this could be uh, within a program. This could be, for example, a U16, U17, and U18 team um, that either have three different coaches operating independently or you have three coaches working across all the teams um, and the teams training together more frequently and being able to break up. So this just gives you a, a little bit of a graphic example of, of what we just went through on it. So a couple benefits to the club-based staffing model. Number one, it gives multiple perspectives for the players. So they can talk to different coaches who have a different way of looking at the game or a different way of talking or teaching or reaching that player. Um, one of the challenges in a club-based model is making sure your staff is on the same page and making sure you're not getting contradictory mo uh, messages from different coaches. But a real positive is that every, every player is going to respond better to one type of personality or one coach uh, or one, uh, one way of communication than another. And having a, having a club-based model basically ensures that you're going to have a coaching personality to meet the different playing personalities within the program, no matter what they are. And my webinar seems to have frozen here. Okay, let me just, uh, I think what's happened is we've hit our limit of people on the webinar, which is great, but it slows down the presentation. Let me just uh, click on there for you. Okay, how's that? Okay, there we go, thank you. Um, Second, of, uh, second advantage of it is there's more individual feedback and contact within a club-based model. Now, that seems sometimes a little bit um, a little bit difficult to understand. If you have one coach and 18 players, you have a ratio of 18 to 1. How is it much different if you have two coaches and 35 players or three coaches and 45 or whatever it may be? Um, one, in a club-based model, it's easier to bring in part-time people on a one-day-a-week, two-day-a-week, type uh, structure, where somebody doesn't have to have the responsibility of being there every single day and doing all the other stuff that's involved in operating a team. So you can bring in people that improve your coaching ratios who are not there and not having to be there every single day. That allows you to lower your coaching ratios or, or actually increase your coach-to-player ratio. Um, another way is when you have multiple coaches, you have one coach who is leading the activity and another coach or two who can work uh, by pulling players out individually and speaking to players individually, which is very, very difficult to do when it's just one coach and 18 players. But with the lead and assistance within the environment, it becomes more uh, practical to make very specific targeted feedback to players. Um, within pool-based training, you also have a, uh, a club-based model. You have more ability for functional training or ability-based breakouts um, because you can take six, eight backs out across two age groups and train back fours together. You can take your eight forwards out and have a lot more variety in the finishing combinations you can do than if you're just doing it with two or three forwards. Um, you know, obviously the coaching, having the ability to have multiple coaches is, is uh, imperative to this. It's also easier to break out based on ability, uh, to take training groups and plan training groups and say, okay, these 10 players here, maybe they need a more technical-based session today and this group can be a little bit more demanding and from a tactical standpoint or even even in competition to match uh, levels better uh, in 4v4s or 5v2s by breaking them by ability uh, in a way that's harder when it's just 18 players and you have the, the bottom three or four that really struggle to compete with the top 18. Uh, a a club-based model provides more consistency across the age groups because teams are training together. It's also more engaging and rewarding for the staff because staff feel like they're not on an island as much. They're, they're interacting with other adults and interacting and, and talking with other coaches, and that can be good for a stress reliever. It can be good to share ideas. It can just be good for you know, the camaraderie within the staff. Provides more club control uh, in the sense that you don't have uh, lone wolf coaches that are off on their own with one team with very low club interaction. And it also allows development of more coaching specialists. 
somebody who really spend their time focusing on how, how do you train the, uh, the defending uh, back four? How do you get more and more into the details and subtleties of that area of the field or that function, whether it's forwards, midfielders, wide players, whatever it may be. So there's a lot of positives from club-based models. Going into curriculum and implementation and periodization. Uh, and, I, and I guess I'll start this by comparing the old school coach with the new school coaching club. Um, the old school coach coaching uh, structure is really training sessions are, are pretty reactionary. They're created based on you know a couple of hours before training, uh, coming up with your thoughts of what you want to do, generally thinking about well, what did we do yesterday and how do we change it a little bit, or what did we not do well on Saturday's game and let's train that on Monday. And to a certain extent, some of that's going to be a reality no matter what you do. Um, but more and more, the professionalism required in coaching and the teaching methodology and the resources out there are making that an ineffective way of coaching. Um, the old school coach fitness is a separate component of the training session. Um, and individual coaches design their team's program individually. The modern coaching club training sessions are based on a year-long plan, a periodization plan that focuses when do we, when do we train certain topics, when do we put the highest physical loads on the players? How do we break down topics from, from a monthly basis down to a weekly basis? Fitness is integrated into every activity through monitoring the physical load of the activity, the work-to-rest ratios that you're putting into those activities, and then understanding of sports science. Uh, and that's not something you need to be a kinesiologist to understand or you need to have an expert uh, degree to understand but a little bit of knowledge can really help you understand how to increase intensity and how to monitor loads um, in ways that you get better development rather than just sort of throwing kids out there for a 90-minute training session without too much thought in it. Um, and then in the modern club, again, in a club-based model, you have directors developing training programs for all age groups and coordinating across the age groups. Periodization is basically a fancy way of saying planning. It's planning your training and development schedule over time to maximize performance and minimize risk of injury. And this, it, you periodize topics, you periodize physical loads, you periodize the number and frequency of training sessions. So it's basically dividing the season into segments. You can break it down into pre-season, mid-season. Uh, when you look at your competition season, usually you have different times where even within a competition season you have a higher number of games versus a lower number of games or you look at it saying the games probably in the last third of the season are going to be a little bit more demanding or more um, important, maybe, in terms of standings and final qualifications in the, the games in the first couple of weeks. Uh, how do you manage an off-season? Uh, how do you manage the post-season? So looking down just on how, when do you want your teams to peak, when do you want them to be at their freshest, and when do you really want to push to build uh, fitness or power or strength uh, the most. You can look at it from a sports cycle uh, or a training topic screens in terms of a preparation period where you might be emphasizing some of the standards in your club uh, or, the, or the ways you want to play generally. Uh, you can talk about basic tactics, 1v1, 2v2, attacking, defending, wide play. You can talk about periods when you're going to emphasize more functionally or more team organization. What does it really mean in the way that we want to play a 4-4-2? Are we going to have a diamond midfielder or a flat midfielder? How is our right midfielder maybe with some of his or her unique qualities? How are they going to feel, fit into our team concept? You can look at it from a volume and intensity standpoint in terms of your trainings, how many and how much uh, are you demanding. You can look at it from an emphasis uh, in the four components. When are you more technically focused and when are you more tactically focused, for example. And then obviously there's physical demands. When are you demanding the most from an anaerobic standpoint, from a power standpoint, um, and all that type of thing. So some questions to go through. And again, if you think of periodization as planning, you're, you're taking steps forward and, and doing things in a way that, that helps make sure that you're going to be a better and more effective development uh, coach. How many trainings and games in the week are in your cycle? Because that will help you manage not only what you go through and how many training sessions does it take to get a concept taught appropriately, but when are they going to be fresh, and when are you going to push them too much? Uh, when do you overload players? Um, if you think about the typical, the, the typical science talks about <coughs> saying after a game you need typically 72 hours to recover to, to be back where you were physically before the game. 
how do you manage that in terms of what you expect on training the day before or the day after games? What activities or sessions create the greatest physical demand? Um, a lot of people think, okay, playing 8v8 on a big field is going to be the biggest demand. That's not necessarily so. If you think about playing 1v1 and 2v2 in terms of the speed and power of movement that's required and the lack of rest time when you're playing smaller sided. So which, understanding which sessions are really going to demand physically a lot from the players and which sessions are going to be a little bit easier. How long should training sessions go and how long should activities within the sessions go? What are the work to rest ratios that should be implemented? You know, one, one thing that you can see very, very illuminative is if you just play your, your take any type of activity and if you break it down into two or three minute periods and then give the players a minute off, you'll see by the third time you do that, the third rep that you've done with a shorter time period, you will see the speed and quality of that game, whatever it is, or that activity, significantly increase compared to if you have the same activity generally going for seven, eight minutes in a row. Because players pace themselves, players get tired. And as, as you teach them about pushing for these two, three, four minute periods and then recovering, you see the quality and the intensity go significantly higher, which has a direct impact on fitness. Curriculum is probably one of the most overused words, in my opinion, in youth soccer. Everybody talks about a curriculum. Everybody says they have the best curriculum. Uh, to me, curriculum is like a cookbook. Just because you have it doesn't mean that you can actually do anything appropriately uh, in terms of developing players. It really comes down to implementation. How do you make sure that your curriculum is reflected in the training sessions that actually occur on the field? How do you make sure your coaches are actually buying it? So a curriculum, first of all, has to be realistic to players' current ability level. Um, you, you, uh, having a curriculum that's great in tactical concepts uh, at under 15 and 16 doesn't really help you if your players struggle to execute basic techniques at 15 and 16. So your curriculum is going to have to change based on where your players are uh, in their development, even within the same age group. Um, I like the analogy of a, a curriculum needs to be a GPS. It needs to provide a map to where you want to go. So if your 17s, if that is the, the pinnacle of your club, or 18s, that's the highest level of your club, and you look at what is required to play at the highest level in the leagues you're in or the places players aspire to get to, then you back your curriculum out from that. So if, this is, if these skills and concepts are required at 18, well, then what do we need to We need to make sure we have those done by 17. And then what's required at 17 determines what's done at 16 and get back all the way down. Obviously, it's got to be age appropriate. And another thing, a curriculum's got to change over time. Coaches that are running the same training sessions now that they were running in 1995, or they're running the same training session with the same coaching points now as uh, they were made in 2000, are probably behind the time. That doesn't mean that the game is totally changing every minute, but it does mean that there are changes in methodology. There is new research about how players learn and the best ways of training different things. And if you're not keeping up on that, your curriculum's outdated, and you're probably falling behind clubs that are more professionalized in terms of their ongoing education and learning. <clears throat> Implementing a, cur a curriculum requires a, uh, your coaches really to understand and buy into the philosophy. Um, it requires that they follow it. You as a director need to make sure that when your coaches go out there, the activities they are putting on the field are what is required in the curriculum and that they understand what the teaching point and the focus is at each age group and at each stage. Um, and you also obviously need to understand that they can identify the key points. But that, that's more of a dialogue process with your coaches. And I, I think curriculum that's developed with the staff is always going to be more successfully implemented than a curriculum that's just imposed from above. The best clubs, and this is a reflection of curriculum, uh, are known uh, for certain ways they play, whether it's because they're very hard to break down defensively and very organized, or because they're really dynamic in attack, or because they're great on set pieces and dead balls and second balls, whatever it may be, the best clubs have a defined style of play, a defined attribute about them that's really driven by the directors and the staff and consistent and, and good uh, adherence to a developmental curriculum and philosophy. So I'm talking about 
one of those types of philosophy. Let's just look at if you're a club and you want to be a possession-oriented team and club, and when people watch your club, you want them to say they're very good at keeping the ball. They're very possession-oriented. They're very good at building through the thirds of the field and playing from the back into the midfield and into front. So you have to identify what's required for that style. So obviously, and I don't want to exaggerate the point here, but a possession point in style requires high, highly technical players that value the ball and who are smart in how to combine in small places. If you don't have these three things, you can talk all day long about possession, but you're not going to be successful. Having three players on the field who can't pass and receive breaks down any type, type of possession. Having players that don't understand uh, that you want the ball and don't prioritize those types of decisions impacts, obviously, how, how frequently you turn the ball over. So looking at that, how do we translate these requirements into a training methodology, which then is what's going to drive our curriculum? So you look from the style we want to the requirements that that style demands in terms of player ability and team performance, and then we look at how do we train them. Here's some examples. If, we, if uh, we're going to have a possession-oriented training rhythm, we need to incorporate technical work into every session. And primarily, that's technical work in terms of passing and receiving of various distances, various surfaces, and adding subtleties in terms of bending a ball, deception in receiving a ball, a deception in passing a ball. But you need to incorporate technical work of passing and receiving in every session. You need to incorporate possession games in every session. And that those can be even numbered, those can be 5v2, they can be directional, non-directional, but you have to have activities that emphasize it is important in this club or the most successful players in this club are the ones that keep the ball. Uh, and you need to encourage simplicity of choice and the value of possession in every activity you do and in every competition you do. If you Emphasize scoring goals all the time and that being a high-risk, high-reward, that's fine. That may be part of being really dynamic going forward, and certain players may certainly respond to that. But that's not going to uh, help you establish the importance of possession, especially with young players. You have to pick your philosophy and pick your priority, priorities and make sure those are consistently emphasized to the players. So... <clears throat> You know, how, how do we do this? Because if we do the same activities over and over, obviously you diminish the returns in terms of the learning, but you also increase the likelihood the players get bored and they don't work as hard. So from a technical work, you need to find ways to train the same concepts, to train and get huge amounts of repetition in different ways so that the activities seem different to the players but they're teaching the same things. So sometimes that's called hidden learning. So I've got a couple of slides here and just different ways of teaching uh, passing and receiving techniques. So the first one is a basic diamond pattern here. Player one to two, two to three, three to four. It's just sort of a, a, a straight diagonal type combination. You can come up with a dozen different combination patterns out of a diamond shape where the players are challenged by having something new and different to do, but the coaching points stay the same in terms of counter movement, check away, check through, in terms of pace of pass, demanding and putting a precise pass um, to the right foot or to the left foot, uh, bending a ball uh, into a path of a runner, maybe different surfaces with a driven ball over a longer distance. So you could take the same diamond and you could double the size and work on driven balls versus short combination play. The next slide is just a box. And I'm sure most of us have done all of these types of patterns, but this is just a, a, a longer ball and then a setback and a diagonal ball. Um, a different way of training the same concepts over and over and over. The third one is just a Y pattern. You know, a ball forward, a layoff, a ball forward again, and then a wall pass. These are three different shapes, three different training activities, each one of which has a thousand different variations of rhythms, of patterns, of distances that you can create so that Practices vary from day to day, but every day you're emphasizing passing, receiving technique. You're emphasizing the tactical cues, checking your shoulder, creating space, counter movement. You're emphasizing the decision making and the body mechanics that you want to play a possession oriented style of play. That's basically what this uh, final point goes. 
And within these, you can do these same sessions with under 11, where your focus is more on actual technique, lock your ankle, get your knee over the ball, uh, that type of very basic biomechanical stuff. Or you can do these with professional players. And your emphasis becomes about quality, about being perfect 10 out of 10 times, about adding deception, about doing it faster with bigger pace, about doing it with the ball in, an air, in the air, um, all sorts of different more uh, advanced subtleties. And really what you're doing here by incorporating these types of activities in every one of your training sessions, you're getting a huge amount of repetition of the technique and the type of movement in the game that's required to play professional handed soccer. Uh, you're emphasizing the style of play you want to have in terms of constant movement, constant combinations, constant passing, and you're emphasizing what's valued, which is we keep the ball. We combine. We don't panic. We play with each other. We move it quickly, and we keep the ball. So that's obviously just one example. You, 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 depending on the, what your club, uh, what your style is, what your philosophy is, you can create the same type of session structure for, um, for any other type of style, or certainly even, even breaking it down more into the way we defend or the way we attack. Do we attack by getting balls wide and putting balls in? Do we attack by combining through the middle and breaking people down in, in quick combinations? You can have the same concepts in developing those types of things. So the final part of the presentation here is uh, club, club culture uh, and creating culture, which really is the way that your players uh, act and the way your staff acts and the way everybody interacts. Culture is as much a part of player development as training sessions are. So you look at ways you can measure culture, mental toughness of players. That's something that can be trained. That's something that can be developed. That's something that can be encouraged. Certain cities don't have a monopoly on having tough players who are good at winning head balls, but tough players that are good in the tackle. That's something that's demanded in the environment. Competitiveness, how, how driven are players that can be taught. The style of play, which you want to Commitment to development. These are all different ways that you measure the culture uh, within your club. And the better the culture is, the more consistent the culture is, the more effective you are on player development. Culture is created by messaging, by actions and communication. What do you model? What do you encourage? What do you do to integrate teams? What do you do making sure that teams are doing things together on and off the field and across the issue? That creates culture. And finally, how do you measure it? Your coaches use similar terminology. If you want your players to really understand what you're talking about and embrace and internalize your style of play, then your coaches need to use the same words and the same concepts in teaching the same uh, activities. Do your players actually say the things you say? Do your players use your words? If they are, that's a good sign that they're bought, they're bought in, that they understand what you're teaching and they're embracing what you're teaching. Do they know what to expect within a training session? If we go back to my example of possession or in a training session, if you're a possession-oriented club, do your players know that generally every day we're going to do some type of technical work in passing receiving and then some type of possession and then some type of more functional or uh, you know, bigger picture uh, organization? That's how we train. Do your players understand that or do they not really know the way you train? Do they not explain it? Do other clubs recognize the way you play? I think it's a great thought exercise. You'll know, ask the clubs you play against. Ask them what they think about your club. Ask them if they had to describe your club in three words or three sentences, what would they do? And if they can't come up with it, that's probably a sign that your teams are on different pages and playing different ways and your coaches are very independent. Uh, do your players get the same message from the different coaches? You, know, you have to manage your coaches to make sure that everybody's on the same page and pulling in the same direction. Are your core values communicated consistently and are they seen in action? Do your coaches act? and represent themselves in the way you want your players to act. And that's as simple as if your coaches are screaming at referees, don't be surprised when your players get flustered and scream at referees. Um, if your coaches consistently emphasize possession, even in competitive games, that's how you develop calm players who and think about possession even in difficult moments. So that's the end of the presentation. I, I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, attendance. And again, these are opinions, not facts, but take them or leave them. This is, these are my thoughts based on discussions and the, the, the people I've learned from and the people I continue to learn from and just our own trial and error as club coaches. I'm sure some of these things everybody may disagree with. Some may resonate, some may not. But really, when you talk about building a club, it comes down to 
you got to define your mission and goal, communicate it, and then find people that can execute it. How you do that uh, really is going to be uh, what determines the success of your club, but also what makes your club different from 